I appreciate those of you who could break away to, uh, to join us to hear a little bit about another kind of madness, I, I think it's fair to say, um, a program that we as Americans have not yet really properly understood, let alone come to grips with. And part of the uh, extent of the lack of understanding is manifest in our inability even to figure out what to call it. Um, I myself, among many others, have used a variety of different descriptors to talk about what is fundamentally an ideological program, one that has a clear um, grounding and some very ominous implications, and yet we're struggling to find a way to identify it, to help people uh, understand it, as I say, and of course, come to grips with it. Uh, some of the terms that have been used in the past uh, and by some today include political Islam, fundamentalist Islam, radical Islam, extremist Islam, Islamofascism was one that I think when I was last with you, Suzanne, I was using myself. And all of them fall short in, I think, one particularly important respect. And that is to the extent that they all use in one form or another the root word Islam, they almost immediately suggest to people who consider themselves to be Muslims that they are all part of the problem. They typically become defensive. Uh, worst case, they become part of the problem, driven into the arms of the people who authentically embrace this ideology. So let me start by suggesting to you a term that I think is both more accurate as a descriptor of this phenomenon, and one that does not have, at least in theory, does not have that particular problem, uh, collateral damage, if you will, unintentionally um, complicating our relationships with what are, I think, conservatively, hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world who do not themselves practice their faith in accordance with this ideological program, let alone seek to impose it on the rest of us, as do those who adhere to the program. So let me offer this as a starting point. I think the best way to describe the ideology that constitutes today the most serious totalitarian threat to freedom in the world is the term that its adherents use themselves, Sharia. By that term, they mean not simply Sharia law, which is the way it is often discussed, particularly by non-Muslims. To be sure, there are many aspects of it that involve law. But it actually is much more comprehensive in terms of its character and certainly its application. It governs every aspect of life from how an individual prays, how often they pray, in which direction they pray, what they wash before they pray, what they don't wash, what they say when they pray, up to how they interact with family members, particularly their wives, their daughters, how they interface with their neighbors, their business associates, all the way up to how, literally, how the world is to be governed. And according to Sharia, how the world is to be governed is 
under a global theocracy. A program that most Muslims, which are of the uh, Sunni sect, call the caliphate. And to the extent that Sharia not only sets that as the goal, but dictates that it is the obligation of all adherent Muslims to bring it about, how? Through jihad. We come to where this particular ideology constitutes a mortal threat to those of us in the West, including those of us here in the United States. Because on the one hand, of course, a theocratic form of government is not consistent with the Constitution of the United States or the freedoms that it enshrines or the government that it prescribes. There is absolutely no way the two can coexist under a constitution that explicitly describes itself as the supreme law of the land because those who believe Sharia must be the supreme law of the land won't accept the superiority of the constitution and frankly are, as I say, obliged by their faith, by the ideological program of Sharia to supplant that government with one of their preference, the Islamic caliphate, if you will. So jihad is the way that the caliphate, the triumph of Islam, the forced submission of all others to Islam is to be accomplished. And of course, since 9-11 particularly, all of us have, to one degree or another, appreciated the character of jihad as a violent, terror-inflicting exercise. But interestingly enough, as much of a menace as that is, and we've seen many thousands of people here and elsewhere killed in the name of jihad, there is another element to this that is at least, I believe, as insidious and worrying. Sharia recognizes that where one, <coughs> excuse me, where one cannot practically engage in violent jihad, maybe you yourself aren't capable of it or are unwilling to kill yourself, you nonetheless have an obligation to pursue jihad through other means, either through financial support to those who are willing to engage in the violent sort of warfare, or through more stealthy techniques, civilizational jihad, they call it. And to the extent that we have seen, most especially in Europe, but increasingly in the United States in recent years, increasing symptoms of that kind of stealth jihad, I suggest to you the problem is both more acute and far more comprehensive than even many who are experts in national security, let alone the public at large, appreciate. Let me give you a couple of examples of how the stealth jihad is manifesting itself, not just abroad, but here. Some of these are, I'm sure, familiar to you at least at some level, and some of them may be news to you. But trust me on this. This is a very, very small sample of a much larger category, much larger problem. Um, 
I think when I was last here, Suzanne, I talked a little bit about one of these manifestations of stealth jihad, uh, something called Sharia compliant finance. Now, the first clue that there's something wrong with this is the first word. One of the reasons why I want to focus your attention on Sharia as a problem is when you hear people say what they're doing is promoting through financial or other means Sharia, it's a red flag. Now sadly, especially since September 2008, when our economy and that of much of the rest of the world began to suffer acute difficulties, the importance of recycling petrodollars, many of which found their way into the treasuries and sovereign wealth funds of those who espouse and seek to impose on everybody else Sharia, has meant that the financial sector of the United States is now, and other Western capitals, is now embracing the idea of Sharia compliant finance. What is it? Well, people in the business will tell you it's, it's really nothing more than a kind of socially responsible investing program, essentially the same thing as what Methodists or Baptists or Lutherans or Catholics or Jews have. Why shouldn't Muslims have their investment program that conforms to their sort of religious principles. In that vein, we're told, it means that you eschew interest, either the charging or the earning of it, charging uh, or paying of it, rather. Um, of course, you're not supposed to invest in activities that involve pork or gambling or tobacco or alcohol or Western defense. It's okay to invest in Islamic defense, but not Western defense. But at the end of the day, what really defines Sharia compliant financial activities from those that are not Sharia compliant is that somebody, some authority, some Sharia scholar who sits on an advisory board tells the investing body, the house, financial house, whatever, that's compliant. That's halal, as they say, kosher. Or that's haram, not pure. And if it's deemed by that advisor to be halal, it's a go. Now, why is that important? That's important because that Sharia advisor is one of the preeminent promoters of Sharia in the world. So think about it. In every one of these Western financial institutions where Sharia finance is now being practiced, we have Seated, seated at approximately board level, people who espouse the program that, as I've just indicated to you, requires the destruction of our country, of our government, of our constitution, of our freedoms. I'm in the company of one of my friends and personal heroes and former bosses, who was instrumental in waging and winning the Cold War, Dr. Freddie Clay. It is a great privilege to have you here, sir. I would submit to you that when we were in the Pentagon, if Wall Street had incomparable positions to those Sharia advisors today, agents of the KGB, that Cold War would not have worked out as it did. 
despite President Reagan's efforts. And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, this war against this totalitarian ideology similarly will not come out right. If the capital and credit flows of this economy are at least substantially influenced by, if not actually controlled by, proponents of Sharia. To give you a personal sense of the implications of all of this, a colleague of mine, David Yerushalmi, our general counsel at the Center for Security Policy, is right now involved in a lawsuit against the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve Board in which he is challenging our ownership of AIG on the grounds that AIG being the largest purveyor of Sharia compliant insurance products in the world violates the establishment clause of the Constitution of the United States. The separation of church and state because we can't be owning a company that's promoting a religion. And I don't mean, if you go to the website, I don't mean just promoting Sharia compliant insurance products. I'm talking about promoting Sharia, albeit in a somewhat homogenized, dumbed down way. My point is this, that is a symptom of the stealth jihad. In fact, don't take my word for it. One of the preeminent Sharia advisors in the financial industry that is, by the way, today worth somewhere between $800 billion and $1 trillion under investment. One of the preeminent Sharia advisors is a fellow by the name of Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi. Perhaps you've seen him on Al Jazeera where he has a weekly television program which he uses as an information operation against Americans, against Westerners, against Jews, against Israelis, even against innocent women and children where he thinks they should be blown up in the interest of advancing Sharia. I mentioned Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi because he has actually said he, one of the prime movers behind Sharia compliant finance, it is, quote, financial jihad, unquote. Jihad with money. So are we under any illusion that this is a problem? Well, I hope not, but you'd be amazed how many bankers and investment companies are looking the other way, indeed our own government had down at the Treasury Department in November of 2008 a seminar for the policy community where they brought in 60 or so senior government officials to impress upon them, in the words of two Sharia uh, finance promoters at Harvard University, Islamic Finance 101. And interestingly enough, I mean, this was really a kicker. The guy who convened this meeting, you may have heard of, his name was Neil Kashkari. Neil Kashkari was at the time an assistant secretary in the Treasury Department, but more importantly, he was the guy who controlled the $700 billion TARP slush fund. And as a result, he was in a position to determine which banks and other investment institutions got federal money at a difficult time and which didn't. Now, do you think that maybe some of those guys in the financial sector took away from this pep rally for Sharia finance in the Treasury Department headquarters the idea that their government wants them to go this way, to begin to do business with Sharia finance? I submit to you they did. So there is an example, a concrete, 
troubling example of the stealth jihad and its penetration of our society. I can give you a bunch of others. Let me just give you two more. Um, you're all familiar, of course, with the violent kind of jihad that went down in November at Fort Hood. A man, a major in the United States Army, who had exposed his colleagues to his Sharia adherent views prior to killing 13 of those folks down there, something he is obliged to do, by the way, as a faithful Muslim, giving warning of jihad, giving the opportunity for those targeted to make one of two other choices, besides being killed, convert or submit. Well, he went down, shot them up, and shortly thereafter, the United States government brought into Fort Hood as a trainer for sensitivity training of those who hadn't been killed, a fellow by the name of Louis Safi. Louis Safi is one of the most prominent Muslim Brotherhood operatives in America today, associated with the, uh, I think it's called the Leadership Project, something like that, of the Islamic Society of North America. We know Louis Safi is a moderate because he has publicly declared that as long as people who leave Islam, that is to say apostates, don't go public with their apostasy, they don't have to be killed. But if they say anything about it publicly, they do. Now that passes for moderation, folks, in the Sharia community. Or it passes for stealth jihad, that such an individual is being given access to our military personnel in the aftermath of one of their own having killed a bunch of them. Let me conclude this little litany with another example that I'm especially concerned about. It's not an accident, as I started out my remarks suggesting that we can't properly talk about this, that we can't even properly characterize it, most of us. This ideological program, this agenda of our enemies. It is in fact the case that our enemies have been beavering away for quite some time at trying to prevent this kind of conversation trying to prevent us from understanding what they're about, the nature of the threat. This has taken the most prominent form in a, an initiative that was begun, I think back in 1999, by an entity many of us haven't heard of called the Organization of the Islamic Conference, or OIC. The OIC is something you ought to watch because it is now the most powerful block within the United Nations. It's made up of 57 nations and some wannabe nations like Palestine. And they are all adherent to and promoting of the Sharia program. And as I say, one of their principal agenda items going back for over a decade has been the adoption by the United Nations and thereafter by member states of, in the case of the UN, a resolution, in the case of member states, legislation that not only prohibits but criminalizes speech of the kind I've been engaging in for the past 15 minutes, which is characterized by those who adhere to Sharia as blasphemy. No matter how true 
what I say is if it gives offense to them, if it's not helpful to the faith, it is considered blasphemy, slander. And it must be prohibited. It must be penalized. It is, in fact, a capital offense. But they've been seeking to get this suppression of free speech legitimated by the United Nations for years. And until last year, the government of the United States consistently opposed this manifest violation of our First Amendment. I'm sorry to tell you that last year, under President Obama, the United States government co-sponsored that resolution in the UN Human Rights Council, one of the great oxymorons of all time. And it is now an obligation, if you subscribe to this UN business, an obligation of the United States government to pursue, pursuant to the resolution it co-sponsored with Egypt on behalf of the OIC, a set of, what should we call them, hmm. hate speech laws that would proscribe, as I say, not only this kind of conversation, but basically any kind of conversation that might give offense to Muslims. I offer these three examples, and they are nothing more than just illustrative examples of a longer litany that we could talk about if you'd like, but three examples of a stealthy kind of jihad against our freedoms, against our constitution, against our government that is surprisingly far advanced. Not just in the Netherlands where Geert Wilders is being prosecuted on the basis of hate speech laws to, to the obscene point where he's not allowed to provide by way of defense proof that he's been factually accurate in what he said. It doesn't matter. It's given offense. And he faces several years in prison. There's the natty problem that he may become the next prime minister of the Netherlands, but never mind. He's being prosecuted by his government today. But it's not just in the Netherlands or just in Germany or France or Britain or Italy or any number of other places overseas. It's here. And because it's stealthy, much of it, and because it is going unaddressed, it is making steady progress. To give you a sense of how seriously it's going unaddressed, I mentioned the Fort Hood massacre. You probably all are aware of the fact that in, I believe it was December, the former Secretary of the Army, Togo West, and the former Chief of Naval Operations, Vern Clark, produced an independent review of what happened at Fort Hood, at which they studied this fellow whose business card read, Soldier of Allah whose briefing to his colleagues at Walter Reed was all about how it was the obligation of faithful Muslims to kill infidels who were going to try to kill Muslims, and whose words upon killing 13 of his colleagues were, Allahu Akbar, the cry of a martyr engaged in jihad. In 86 pages of this independent review, as you may know, the following words were never used once. Islam, Sharia, Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, Islamic terror, even violent extremism, which is the approved euphemism of our government didn't make it into the report. I kind of thought, you know, it's like the guy needed a root canal or something. He was in, you know, physical pain, and that's, that's all there was to it. Well, 
this wasn't a one-off example. I believe the Quadrennial Defense Review of the Department of Defense, major product, as Fred knows, having been through some of these exercises, a major product of thousands, tens of thousands of man hours of our government's most serious and important national security bureaucrats and decision makers also didn't use those words. The Department of Homeland Security quadrennial review, I'm told, didn't use those words either. So we've got a problem, is I guess my bottom line point to you all. We've got a problem with a deadly serious ideological program that is, let me re-emphasize, what authoritative Islam is promoting. You will be told, you may even want to believe, that what I have described is actually just the craziness, the extremism of some radicals who are hijacking the religion. It is indisputably the case that what I have described for you is actually rooted in the authoritative texts and institutions and teachings and traditions and interpretations of the faith. I emphasize, it doesn't mean that everybody who is a Muslim practices it this way, or even knows that that's all true. Some of whom who will tell you it's not true may simply not know. And then there are others, such as one who was featured on uh, NPR's All Things Considered last night, a fellow down in South Carolina, professor, who blithely assured us that terror is is something that will send you straight to hell. I believe he's engaged in a tradition as old as Islam itself called taqiyya, lying for the faith. And so you've got to try to figure out, are you talking when you hear from people that none of this is a problem to people who simply don't know any better? And I think that's true of many Muslims, particularly in the Far East, who have no tradition of Sharia, who don't want to treat their women or each other the way it requires. But I think in many cases, unfortunately, it is also true that people know and they're simply dissembling uh, or, or just lying to us. So this makes matters much more complicated and why I have taken as much of your time as I have to sort of drill down on all of this let me just leave you with a couple of thoughts about what we have to do about it. And then if there are questions, I'd be happy to take them. The first thing we have to do about it, about the problem posed by Sharia and its adherence, is recognize it, is understand it for what it is, is address it as the same kind of toxic, totalitarian, brutally repressive, and ultimately seditious ideology that communism has long been understood to be. Secondly, having properly understood what it is, we need to empower our people, our government, first and foremost, but our people as well, to understand that there are things that we can do to counteract it. Specifically by recognizing that what we're dealing with here is not, as a practical matter, religion, but a political program. We're tolerant people. We give people who practice the most bizarre of religious beliefs wide latitude to do so. But where it is seditious, where it is seeking to impose a new form of law on us instead of our Constitution, 
That is impermissible. And we need to recognize it and act on it as such. In fact, bottom line, I think that keeping America Sharia free has to be a prime focus for all of us who care about our country, not just sort of national security minded folks, but all of us. Because you can absolutely take this, if you will, to the Sharia compliant bank. What we decide to do about this, or alternatively fail to do about this, will affect both the quality and maybe even the very fact of the lives of our children and our grandchildren. And I, for one, am determined not to have my children inherit a country governed by Sharia, in which they will not be equal, in which they will not enjoy the freedoms we take for granted, and in which, in fact, especially given their old man, they may not even be alive. So we need your help with this, and I appreciate so much, Suzanne and Ty, Fred, the opportunity to talk with you about this as hopefully an agenda item of the Defense Forum Foundation and all of those of you who work for people here on the Hill and, frankly, for all of us in this country, because if we don't get this right, I think we'll never be able to live with ourselves as much as what we will be inflicting upon those who come after. Thank you very much.